Welcome to the White Museum of the Canadian Rockies, everyone. It's my pleasure tonight to be in conversation, well, with, with one of the greats, with Chick Scott, the writer, the climber, skier, the historian, the adventurer, and all points in between. You usually moderate these fireside chats, Chick, so let me ask, does it feel a little bit strange to be sitting over there and, and not here? No, it feels completely comfortable. Ooh. It feels, uh, I feel fine. I'm, my father liked to talk. My father liked to tell stories. And I inherited it. So, so I've waited all my life for this moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a long history at the White Museum of these sorts of storytelling history um, conversations and the recording of them for posterity purposes, isn't there? Yes, there is. Um, Peter and Catherine uh, got a very early tape recorder, maybe in the 40s, uh, and this, uh, and they got lots of old timers like Ed Foytz and, and then Lizzie Rummel um, carried on and Lizzie uh, carried on the tradition of recording local stories. So um, the tradition has been around for a long time. Um, I started doing it, probably my first interviews, well, my first interviews were actually 1982, after the guys came back from Mount Everest, and I took a beat-up old tape recorder that we had around the house, real antique clunker, and I went and interviewed Adrian Burgess and Bill March, and they're, they're in the white here. Since then... I've carried on the tradition, and I've done about 300 interviews, and they're all here in the white. You've had a long relationship with the White Museum, with this particular place. How did this place help you find your career as a storyteller? Well, it was hugely important. The White Museum was hugely important in my evolution as a storyteller. I didn't realize I was going to be a storyteller uh, until I became one a lot later. Um, I, I was a mountaineer, I was a guide, all those sort of things. But then later on, I just started collecting the stories. And um, the place to come was to the white. This is where all the stories are kept. This, is the, this place is the memory of Banff. This, this is where our community keeps the stories. There is so much back over there in those archives. I have been mining, you know, like gold panning, mining. <laughs> these archives for 30 years, and I am still finding the most wonderful nuggets, things that you wouldn't believe. I could tell you the stories of, of just coming across something by serendipity, going through a folder, and there's the letter from Eric Pistor, writing to uh, Wheeler, asking for a job for Conrad Kane. There's the original letter. And it wasn't even noted on the cover. It was just, you just find things. And, and so I've done, well, when I finish the two books that I'm working on now, it'll be 15 books, and none of them would have happened without Peter and Catherine's great legacy. Mm. It's a fabulous place here. Fifteen books is pretty impressive for a person, and I've heard you say this before, you never wanted a career. <laughs> Not bad. No, I didn't. Um, you know, I, I grew up in a very nice home in Calgary, and I suppose I was being directed as a upper-middle-class kid towards a, a standard sort of career, but I never, I never thought of myself as having a job or having a career. I just wanted to be me. You know, isn't that what we all said in the 60s? I just want to be me. <laughs> and, and I did. I did. And, you know, I've always had this image in my mind of laying there in my crib as a baby, and beside me there is this beautiful leather-bound book with beautiful paper, beautiful pages, but they're all blank. And you can write the story of your life 
but and we can all do it. And you don't have to be a mountaineer. You can be a musician. You can be a mother. You can be a business person. But I think as people, as human beings, our greatest creative endeavor it is our lives, to live, to create. We create who we are. Uh, and certainly in this country where we have the freedom and security and wealth that we have, we can create our own lives. And so I just never saw myself becoming a job. I saw myself just living a life. And yes, we all have to work. Um, you can't expect to get things in return. You have to work. But don't confuse what you do for a living with who you are as a person. They're not the same thing. Another Banff cultural institution, and specifically this one organized around literacy and the public good. The Banff Public Library is just next door. You've also had a relationship with that institution. I Quite have. Um, I love libraries. I've been going to libraries since I was probably five or six years old. I used to go into the public libraries in Calgary and look at books of dinosaurs and knights in medieval armor. They're so interesting. They're so inspiring. Um, and then here in Banff, we have one of the most beautiful, comfortable, warm libraries. Um, you just feel so comfortable sitting in there underneath that skylight, um, reading a newspaper or reading a book, or just sitting there and watching all the people. And there's mums with their kids. There's senior citizens reading the newspaper. There's seasonal workers, Australian kids, just looking for some place where they can get away from their crowded apartment. There's um, young people with dreadlocks and earrings. They're all in there. It's the last of the commons. The commons, the place where everybody's welcome and you don't have to pay. I mean, so much of our world has been privatized and commercialized. There's almost nowhere you can go anymore that you don't have to buy a cup of coffee. And the library is one of those places. And I think I can honestly say I am the most. Um, I go to the Banff Public Library more than any other individual in Banff. I go there almost every morning to read the newspaper in the morning. I'm often in there in the afternoon. I've written the better part of six or eight books in there. Sometimes I go in the evening to work. I like that workspace. It's very social. Um, and I just love libraries, and it's right next door. And you know who? It's Peter and Catherine's property. It it's, it's, goes via the town, via a sublease. But it's, that's Peter and Catherine's legacy, too, is the library. These two institutions, the white and the library, are the heart of Banff. This is where we think. This is where we feel. You once told me that your life has been exclusively, almost exclusively, about books and about mountaineering. What's the relationship between those two things? Well, um, there's a long relationship between writing and adventuring. So many adventurers, explorers. You know, they go off and have these incredible adventures. Sometimes they'd be gone for two, three, or four years around the world or to the Arctic, to the polar regions. And then they came home, you know, and they, they had a bath. First thing they did, they had a bath. <laughs> and then the second thing they did is they poured themselves a glass of wine. And then they sat down in front of a blank piece of paper with a pen and they wrote, and it just, it goes so hand in hand, adventuring and then writing about it. Long tradition, particularly the British. The British explorers, um, many of them are great explorers, but almost all of them can write. And I guess they learned to write in school, and they wrote fabulous books. Um, and I've sort of had that relationship. I always loved books. And after an experience I had when I was 17 years old, I fell in love with the mountains, too. 
And since then, it's been books and mountains. Because he told me that, I asked him tonight to bring a pile of some of the more influential books, some of which are his and others which are others, folks, uh, that influenced his life, that he could perhaps share some of them with us tonight. And I see that on top of this pile here, we won't pass this around because this is a collector's edition, I think. Is this your first book? That's my first book. There's only one of them. (laughs) The best part of the book is not the content. The best part of the book is the cover and the binding, the stitch binding. I created this book when I was 12 years old in Mrs. Eisner's grade 7 science class. It was my (laughs) class project. I made a book. I mean, I should have known right then. Yeah, you've never had, you don't you'd have any problems telling you stories. Know, I mean, it all makes sense when you look backwards. Uh, life does. But at the time, anyways, it's, it's, it's called Man Becomes Airborne. And it's the history of flight from the Montgolfiers and the Wright brothers and up to something called Trans-Canada Airlines and <laughs> DC-3s and DC-8s. But... Um, you know, it, it was my first book, and I hope I got an A in it. But <laughs> anyways, and my mother, bless my mother, she, she saved it for me. She knew someday I would really like this book. So if you want to come up and look at it afterwards, we'll just leave it right here. So storytelling isn't new to you. It's something that you've had for a while. Where did that come from? Well, it came from my father. My, my, my mother and my father got along very well together. But my mother had one complaint. My father would not shut up. <laughs> and, and he loved to talk. He loved to tell stories. He was a smart man. Um, he should have been a university professor um, or a, a, a teacher. Uh, instead, he got a grade 8 education, as you did in those days, and he went and worked in an office. But... Um, he loved books, and, and, uh, um, and that's where I really get the storytelling from, is from my father. You were a kid in the 50s, lucky, a lucky time to, to grow up in Canada. Yeah, it was. You know, most of us in this room don't realize, well, maybe we do realize, but we all have to stop and remember how lucky we have been. Never in the history of mankind has there been 70 years of such peace and prosperity, particularly here in Canada, in the Western world. I mean, our parents went through two wars and a depression. Um, The history of Europe is just blood and, and carnage the whole time. There's just wars going on all the time. Um, and poverty, and and it's been so lucky. We have been so lucky, um, and uh, and I grew up in that. I was born in 1945, right at the end of the war. I was I'm actually a war baby. I'm not a baby boomer, and uh, I've never had to go to war. I've always had a job every, anytime I wanted. Healthcare came in fairly quickly. When after I was a young child, it's been now things are going a little south now around the world, unfortunately. But it's not like it hasn't happened before. We've been very lucky for so long. We've forgotten how lucky we are. Were books important to you as a as a younger person? They were. Um, I became very interested. Well, actually, my first book, my first little book that I have at home that's my book, that's got my name scrawled in the front, it's a nice little hardcover edition of Peter Pan. (laughs) What else? What else would I have? First to the right and straight on till morning. That's how you get to Neverland. Uh, Peter Pan. But I started reading at an early age. Probably the first grown-up book I read was a very amazing book, 400 years old. It was called Dr. Faustus by Christopher Marlowe. It was premiered in 1592, and it's the story of the man, the philosopher, the, the 
professor who sells his soul to the devil. It's an old Germanic tale, Dr. Faustus. And my brother, who was three years older than me, and I was in grade 10, he was in first year university at U of C, and he was prob- this book was probably on his reading list in first year university English. And I picked it up and read it. I'm 15 years old. I'm reading about this man selling his soul to the devil. And I don't know whether I got very much of it, but it certainly, it certainly got me thinking. And then other books I read at that time. My father had a, a small library of uh, books, and my mother. My mother liked to read too, but we had some good books. To Kill a Mockingbird by Lee Harper, um, The Ugly American, um, and uh, Silent Spring, Rachel Carson, one of the most influential books. It's interesting that, that um, To Kill a Mockingbird and Silent Spring were both written by women at the time. And this is, I guess, 56. Well, Silent Spring was 1962, and it was a hugely influential book. It started, it was the beginning of our modern environmental movement. Mm-hmm. Rachel Carson was a scientist who wrote about how the chemical companies, the big ones, Monsanto Monsanto and DuPont, were poisoning nature with DDT and 2,4-D and these insecticides and herbicides and and just killing off the wilderness. And uh, and I read that book. I read it when it came out in 1962. And although it is largely sort of a technical book, and it's, it's quite serious science work, but it had one beautiful passage, and time to read it? Please do, yeah. Yeah, I've got one, one little quote here, which was a nice quote to read when you're 15 years old. Those who contemplate the beauty of the earth find reserves of strength that will endure as long as life lasts. There is a symbolic as well as an actual beauty in the migration of birds, the ebb and flow of tides, the folded bud ready for spring. There is something infinitely healing in the repeated refrains of nature, the assurance that dawn comes after the night and spring after the winter. What a nice Nice quote, and although I don't remember, I I sort of rediscovered this quote years later, it must have had some sort of a deep influence at the time. Did you come to mountains through books? Um, No, I came to mountains by serendipity. I was a golfer when I was young. I grew up on a golf course. We played at the Earl Grey Golf Course In Calgary, I was a very good golfer. I was a champion golfer. But looking west from the golf course and on my walks to Bicom Bennett High School, there was these mountains out on the western horizon. And I just wanted to go there. For some reason, I don't know why. And um, I um, went, I threw a friend at the golf course, a guy by the name of Russ Bradley, some of you will remember Russ, old-time mountaineer from Calgary. He sent me down to the Youth Hostel Association. And on the Victoria Day weekend, May 24th weekend, 1962, I went on my first trip to the mountains. Um, and it changed my life. I got in a car in Calgary. Earl Smith was at the wheel. Scott Meese was in the back seat. And there was a young woman there by the name of Margaret McGugan, who became Margaret Moser. And we were the same age. We were 17. And and we drove up past Banff, Lake Louise, turned up the Icefield Parkway. It was Friday night, um, nice spring night, lots of late evening light. and, And I was just smitten. As we drove along, I had never been that way before. And we got up to Parker Ridge. We went to the Hilda Creek Youth Hostel for a weekend of skiing, skinning up and skiing down. 
And I just fell in love with the mountains. It just, it was like Dorothy's life. It was like the Wizard of Oz. The world went from black and white to color. I stepped out of color. Technicolor yeah. to Technicolor. I stepped out of, I was growing up in this box in Calgary. It was a nice box. I had everything. Um, good family. Everything went well for me. But, you know, there was something missing. And, and I didn't know what it was. But I had sort of a bit of an unhappiness, a malaise. And up there at Parker Ridge with the, the mountains glistening in the moonlight and under the starlight, the smell of wood smoke in the air, the wind sighing in the trees, the water dripping off the roof in the springtime. It was just a whole other world. And it wasn't halfway around the planet. It was right there in my backyard. It was right there. And, of course, I went back to Calgary, and, and I never played a game of golf again in my life. Broke my, <laughs> broke my dad's heart. He, he wanted me to be a pro, and... And, and, and I, I just, I pretty well ceased playing golf and um, just fell in love with the mountains. And, and since then, my life has been about mountains. It's amazing, you know, when you send kids on trips to places and, and to camp and different things, well, you never know which one will just hit them and change their life. So you just have to, let them find what they want. Yeah. The early 1960s was really the, that era of the, the youth hostel scene in Calgary. Were you a part of that scene? Um, yeah, the youth hostel. Pretty soon the Calgary Mountain Club um, joined, um, became involved with the Calgary Mountain Club about 1963. I remember walking in the, the, up the steps into the Maccabees Hall. We used to meet at the Maccabees Call in Calgary and there was Lloyd McKay and Brian Greenwood and Don Vaughroth, Glenn and Liz Bowles. They were so welcoming. Yeah, come on in. Oh, you want to climb red shirt? Sure, you guys can do it. They were so positive. And uh, so it was really the Calgary Mountain Club, but the youth hostel, the youth hostel, was, let's see, Tuesday night was the Foothills Nordic Ski Club. Wednesday night was the Calgary Mountain Club. Thursday night with the youth hostel. And that's what we did during the week. And you had those meetings, one meeting a week. And then on the weekends, you, you borrowed one of your parents' cars and you drove up to the mountains. Or you hitchhiked. Yeah. Lloyd McKay, who you mentioned, he was an early mentor of yours. He was. Uh, Lloyd, Lo I think quite a few people in the audience here will remember Lloyd. Um, Lloyd came from Nova Scotia as a student. He was a law student at Dalhousie, and he came out here and worked during the summers. He worked as a red cap at the train station, and then he worked in the summers on the rebuilding of the uh, Icefields Parkway. Anyways, when he graduated with his law degree, came west to Calgary, and he articled for a couple of years in Calgary, and then he set up a practice in Banff, and he was the first full-time lawyer who lived in Banff. And he was my best friend. He was a big brother. He took me out. He was a, good, a really good climber, so positive. About six years older than me, which makes a difference when you're that age, when you're a teenager. And uh, he took me climbing, took me up Duratissima and showed me that you could do things like that, that it wasn't that hard. And Lloyd uh, became one of my dear friends. And, and uh, yeah, for the rest of his life. Children growing up, teenagers growing up in the 60s, late 50s, early 60s, all grew up with Earl Bernie's David. And you brought David with you. I did. Tonight. Was that an inf influential poem for you? Well, it was. Um, it was probably my introduction to mountaineering, actually, before I even went up to the, uh, the, the Hilda Creek Youth Hostel. We would have read David in our grade 10 readers, I think. Mm -hmm. And it's a poem by Earl Burney, who lived here in Banff. Um, it's about 
two young men, probably teenagers, 17, 18 years old, discovering a mountain climbing here in the Bow Valley and climbing a mountain called the Finger, which is out there just west of Banff. And of course, my friend and I, Jerry Walsh and I, who was my, Jerry was my climbing partner, we um, just related to David and Bobby and we were them. We were living their life. It's, it's interesting how, you know, sometimes I don't even know whether I actually live something or whether I read it in a book. Yeah. You know, it gets mixed up. The difference between books and living, it's, you can live through books too. And if a book or something is well written, it can be as real as life. So here's just the first couple of stanzas from this beautiful poem by Earl Burney. David and I that summer cut trails on the survey all week in the valley for wages in air that was steeped in the wail of mosquitoes. But over the sun alive weekends, we climbed to get from the ruck of the camp, the surly poker, the wrangling, the snoring under the fetid tents. And because we had joy in our lengthening coltish muscles and mountains for David, were made to see over stairs from the valley and steps to the sun's retreats. Beautiful poem. Probably the finest mountain poem ever written in the whole world, I think. You're a romantic chick. I am. <laughs> oh, absolutely. If you're not a romantic, you're missing life. Life is such a romantic affair. I mean, it, it is. We're human beings. We feel. We love. We, we have adventures. We hurt. It's romantic. It's, it's not about making money and, and getting ahead. It's about living and feeling and being. Early mountain sport wasn't about competition for you. It was about being in this place with your friends. You're reading Thoreau. You know, it's, yeah. Yeah, well, absolutely. I, that first trip that I went with the youth hostels up to uh, the Hilda Creek Youth Hostel, I was so impressed, and it was so nice, because everybody was so good to me. Of course, I had brought the wrong equipment, and I didn't know what to do, and I, I had never gone ski touring before, and people took care of me. And, of course, I had grown up, in the competitive sports world in Calgary, where it's about winning, it's about competition. And, and I discovered this world where it wasn't about competition. It was about sharing. It was about helping people. It was about, we could all get to the top of the mountain. Everybody could get to the top. And, and the most respected members of the group were those that contributed the most, that helped the most, not those that beat you or got richest. Or, and and uh, those people in the youth hostel group were so good to me. They loaned me equipment. They showed me how to do things. I remember Connie Wilcock, uh, a young woman, maybe a couple years older than me, she showed me how to chop firewood. I always thought that that was cute, that a, a, a teenage girl taught me how to chop wood, you know, how to set the wood up and chop through it. And, and uh, A bit different from swinging a golf club. Different. Oh, I loved golf. I loved hitting the ball, but I hated the competition. I, it just, it felt good when you were winning, but it felt so bad. And I thought, a sport where you feel bad 90% of the time? Why, why are you doing it? Whereas in the mountains, we could all feel good all the time. And we didn't even have to get to the top of the mountain. If we came back safely and we had a good time, then we all had a good time. Everybody could be a winner. So anyways, I, I gave up competitive sports. And I really, me and my friend Jerry, who I climbed with, Jerry Walsh, we became real oddballs at school. We were climbing. We were spending our weekends doing the real thing. And we were doing the real thing. It wasn't particularly hard but it doesn't have to be really hard to be the real thing in climbing. And we came back to our friends 
at Viscount Bennett and Central High School in Calgary, we were living in different worlds. We just, we had left it behind. Mm. Yeah. By the middle of the 60s and into the later part of that decade, you were pushing the standard of climbing, at least here in Canada, with your winter ascents, with some of the, the folks, the guys that you already mentioned. Were you aware that you were pushing the sport forward here during those times? Well, we were, and we were really trying to push the sport forward. We realized that um, the sport of mountaineering in Canada was 50 years behind Europe. Uh, I mean, it was, we were just, Canadian climbing had been left behind completely in the 30s and 40s in Europe with Heckmeyer and Camichi and Ricardo Cassin and the great climbers of Europe. They were climbing so far beyond. And here in Canada, um, we were living sort of the tail end of, of almost the 19th century. Um, and the Alpine Club was, was not a, an active progressive club. And then uh, it changed, uh, started to change with Leo, who's here in the audience tonight, and Hans Moser, his, his buddy, um, and other climbers who came from Europe in the 50s and into the 60s, and they brought a new standard of climbing, a new approach to climbing, and it started to change. But it, it wasn't young Canadians doing it, born in Canada Canadians. It was ca climbing in Canada until the 60s, had leading edge climbing, had all been British uh, and American clients and their Swiss and Austrian guides. And then in the 50s, Austrians and, and Germans. Um, and then it changed in the 60s. Um, most people don't realize, I mean, everybody, you know, all of our mountain rescue professionals, all of our guides today, all of our avalanche experts, they're all Canadian kids born in Canada, learned their trade here. But that wasn't true in the early 60s. There were almost no born in Canada Canadians in the game. And I mean, at one point, uh, I think about 1970, I remember there were 17 guides at, at the Bugaboo helicopter skiing, and 16 of them were European. Um, so it gives you an idea of, but in the 60s, people certainly like Lloyd McKay and Don Vaucroft were the first born in Canada Canadians to be on the leading edge, to do hard new climbs. And then Don Gardner, Charlie Locke, and myself. And one of the things that we did is we pushed winter climbing. Um, new routes as well, but winter climbing. 50 years earlier, all the big peaks in the Alps had been climbed in the winter. But in 1967 and 66, virtually none of the big peaks. Robson had been climbed by Americans, but um, none of the big peaks have been climbed. And so in the 60s, our group from Calgary started with Hungabi in 66 and then Assiniboine in 67. We started making, it wasn't about competition, it was just a like self-respect. <laughs> so hard done by. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> You were introduced in those years, too, to mountain film, not just both, but mountain film, at the Jubilee Auditorium, the theater in Calgary with Hans Moser. I was. Yeah, I went to some of his early films. I certainly remember 1963 going to see Skis Over McKinley in the Jubilee Auditorium, and I had met Hans and Leo that autumn when we carried the stove into the Stanley Mitchell hut. And I remember at that showing in November of 63, Hans came up to me and he said, hi, Chick. He remembered my name. And I mean, I, since then, I really understood how the nicest thing you can do for anybody in the world, and it costs nothing, is try to remember their name. 
Remember people's names and work on it. Don't expect it to come easy because it doesn't come easy for anybody. You work on it. And that's how you can do everybody a nice favor. Anyways, I went and saw Hans's film and uh, Hans was a big star. This is before helicopter skiing had started. He was a big star and he really influenced, he influenced all of us. And you're also influenced by his writing as well. I was. Here. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Here it is. Here. This is uh, from an article in the Canadian Alpine Journal. Hans was so eloquent. Although English was a second language, um, he wrote so beautifully, and I could read a number of quotes. But this one I really love. In the end, to ski is to travel fast and free, free over the untouched snow-covered country, to be bound to one slope, even to one mountain, by a lift may be convenient, but it robs us of the greatest pleasure that skiing can give, that is, to travel through the wide, wintry country, to follow the lure of the peaks which tempt on the horizon, and to be alone for a few days or even a few hours in clear, mysterious surroundings. Just beautiful. Mm. In 1967, you were 19. It was Canada's 100th birthday, and you and three chums, two of whom were also just 19, decided to do something that the great Hans Moser in those days couldn't do, and that's ski the Great Divide, traverse from Jasper to Lake Louise, connecting all of the ice fields in between. This is before avalanche beacons and transceivers and before modern communication. Mm. You were on cross-country skis. What were you thinking? (laughs) Um, Well, I can honestly say that we never thought for a moment that we wouldn't make it. That's the joy of being young. You have confidence. (laughs) But uh, we planned. We spent the whole winter planning diligently. We studied Hans's attempt. He had attempted to ski the Great Divide in 1960 and made it a little less than halfway. He had had some problems with the weather, and he had made some mistakes. His equipment is his equipment was too just too heavy, so we went lighter. Um, he had dropped his caches from the air. We placed all of our caches by hand so that we wouldn't lose them. And he had lost one, which was a serious problem. But um, yeah, Donnie Gardner, Charlie Locke, Neil Liskey and I, um, we, it's something that we had thought about for a few years. I mean, I had started backcountry skiing in 1962. By 1967, I had been at it five years. I had been on a glacier maybe four times. Um, I was no expert, but we all had good judgment. Donnie was the most experienced of us, and we prepared well, and it went just beautifully. We had no problems. It was The trip was done completely different. Hands and the way trips were done by some people in those days were top down. The boss gives the orders and the directions. We had no boss. There was no leader of our trip. We were four young, and we were young. We were 20. And um, um, I don't remember anybody ever giving an order or saying, we'll do this or that. We just flowed. We just flowed down the divide. We were lucky with weather, and we were lucky with snow conditions. And you've got to have a little luck. But uh, uh, it went beautifully, and it's still the greatest experience of my life. It was just, it was a personal experience. It wasn't, I mean, we hardly took any pictures. We took a few pictures, no GoPros. Um, uh, I'm actually pleased to say that it was one of the last of the old-style adventures where you weren't in communication when you were out there. When you left, you were gone until you came back. And we registered out for 35 days. Took us 21 days, but, uh, uh, and we did have one flyover. Bill Smythe 
who lives here in Banff, after 14 days, he flew the route to see if he could spot us. And he did spot us. He came up the valley. And we ran out and we waved to him. And he flew back to Banff and told the wardens and phoned our mums and, well, Smitty Gardner and said, the boys are still alive. And, <laughs> and uh, but it, it was so easy. Yeah, we were lucky. I mean, I have to say we were lucky. But, and yeah, we had frozen boots in the morning. And we had storm days. But, I mean, I've read all the polar explorations of the great polar explorers. We weren't doing that. It, it was a fun trip. And all I have is beautiful memories of, of the trip. It was really for you, though, and it didn't occur to me ju until just now, but you didn't write up that trip until the late 70s, 78 maybe, in yeah. the CAJ. Yeah. We didn't, we, when we got to the end of the trip, we had a cup of coffee. We, we came down to Wapta Lodge. It was called Wapta Lodge in those days. We had a cup of coffee. Um, we took one picture. Donnie handed his camera to Mary Paston's father, Mary's in the audience over there, Mary Paston's father. Mary was working at uh, Wapta Lodge, and her father took a picture, one picture. And it was a beautiful picture. He didn't cut off anybody's feet. He didn't cut off the skis. Our eyes are all open. It, it, it worked. It was just a beautiful, and it's become an iconic picture. And then we went home. We didn't even, we didn't go to the bar, we didn't have a drink, we didn't have a dinner, we didn't get together again for 50 years. <laughs> and and Donnie, Donnie came up with the great description of it. He said it was a little bit like one of those Buddhist sand mandalas, where you go to all this effort of building this mandala in the sand, this beautiful work of art and then you just wipe it clean. It's just the experience. It's transitory. It's gone. And that was the beauty of the thing. It was over. And we, we all went our separate ways. Yeah. You went to the Alps. You fell in love with the Alps, particularly the Mont Blanc region, not long after. I did. Well, I fell in love with the mountains of the Alps, the European mountains, right from the beginning. When I came back from Parker's Ridge, I went down to the old Memorial Park Library in Calgary, and they had a librarian there who knew mountain books. And I started reading Nanga Parbat Pilgrimage by Herman Boole, and The White Spider by Heinrich Harrer, and Conquistadors of the Useless by um, Lionel Trey. And all these books had just come out at that time. Conquistadors of Useless was published in English in 1963. They were hot off the press. And one of the books that was hot off the press was this one here, which is still on my special bookshelf, my prized bookshelf by Gaston Rebefau on Snow and Rock. Rebefau was so romantic. Those French writers, those Frenchmen, they're so romantic. <laughs> There's a reason why they're great lovers. <laughs> they're... <laughs> They're so romantic, and uh, do you want me to read this quote? Yeah, please do. Yeah. This is the quote. This is the most beautiful mountaineering quote I have ever read. It's by Gaston Rebefa. It was translated um, from the French by somebody who did a fabulous job. So here we are. It's called The Dream. On the very edge of the world of man, Standing upon the summit, which had been the magic focus of his dreams, the young mountaineer lifted up his body, his heart, his soul, and all his secret longings. As far as the eye could see, a realm of snow and rock lay stretched out before him, wrapped in the silence and mystery of the infinite. It was like being in another world. The mountain seemed less a part of this planet than an entirely independent kingdom, unique and mysterious, where to venture forth, all that was needed was the will and the love. Cracks, chimneys, slabs, 
overhangs. The young man had given of his best to climb them, and now he gave himself up to his thoughts, while there mounted within him a happiness such as he had never known before, but of which he felt a strange, undefined need. The blood surged through his veins. His heart beat with emotion. The air had a sharp tang. The sun poured out its benediction. And at the end of the rope, he had discovered that fine, deep comradeship, the comradeship of climbing companions. And if mist and cloud obscured the world of other men, then this kingdom was his own for a brief snatch of time, a kingdom to which he was to journey again and again. He had triumphed over the ground. He had triumphed over himself. And here was heaven's reward for his endeavor. Youth to live must have some great aspiration. When I was 15, I was as tall as I am now and thinner. I had little strength in my arms and could pull myself up only with difficulty. Yet I longed so much to become a mountaineer and one day perhaps a guide. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah, it's just fabulous. And you can imagine what it does to a teenage boy. <laughs> yeah. You had five seasons of climbing and guiding in the Alps. And during that time, you met and worked for and befriended probably one of perhaps the, the most the greatest climber in the English-speaking world at the time. Tell us about Dougal Haston. Um, yeah, Dougal Haston from Edinburgh, a bit of a troubled guy, bad boy, but then most of us were sort of bad boys. Anyways, he, uh, he was an alpinist, and when I met him in 1968, he was one of the leading climbers, perhaps the leading English-speaking alpinist in the world. His big achievement had been in 1966, climbing the north face of the Eiger in wintertime by a direct route, a very big event at the time. 67, he did a winter ascent of the north face of the Matterhorn. Uh, and I met him in 68 uh, in Switzerland. He was running a climbing school there, the International School of Alpinism. International School of Mountaineering, you know, and he asked me to work for him. He said, Chick, I would like, I'd like you to guide for me. And I said, well, I'd like to do that, but I've never guided before. I don't know what to do. And he said, you know what to do. Just be careful. And the next day I had two young clients. And, and anyways, I had five great seasons. Dougal and I became great friends. I ended up guiding uh, for Dougal, the Matterhorn, the Brenva face of Mont Blanc. I guided Clint Eastwood on the north face of the Eiger. Um, and I did many amateur climbs um, at a fabulous time. I loved the Alps. I just... Climbing in a place like Chamonix is like hockey in Calgary. It's it's what they do. It's... it's, it's and And... And everywhere, it, it just surrounds you. It's, it's a mountain community. It's, a, it's an alpine world. And I loved it. And also, the climbing was really good. And to be honest, here in the Rockies, it's crumbly rock. And I, it, just, it never did. But I like the skiing here in the Rockies, but the climbing just never captured me. But the climbing in the Alps in Chamonix, the most beautiful granite spires, big pillars, three, 4,000-foot ice faces, just fabulous. And then you come down at the end of the evening, you have, or the end of the climb, steak frites salad. You walk down the street, and, and there's famous mountaineers walking around. It, it was pretty neat. I had a wonderful time. And Dougal and I were, were best friends. I was his kid brother, and he became another mentor for me. I've been very lucky with my mentors in my life. Your time in Europe perhaps culminated in 73. You had a great season in 73. And Lloyd McKay was there. Yeah. And guiding aside, you climbed some very big routes in Europe. At a period. Well, 73 was a great year for me. It could have been even much better. 
Started off in the spring, we skied the Rogers Pass, the Bugaboos Traverse, Donnie Gardner, Dave Smith, Ron Robinson, and I. And then about June, I went to the Alps, and with Dave Smith, I did a couple of big North Face routes near Zermatt, the North Face of the Liskam, and a big face, the 4,000-foot North Face of the Durands, uh, um, big, big wells and back route. Um, and it was hard. It was in poor condition. And then I went over to Chamonix. Lloyd McKay came over that summer, and we were representing Canada at the International Climbers Meet in Chamonix. We climbed the north face of the Drew, one of the six great north faces of the Alps. And then we climbed uh, the Swiss route on the north face of Lake Court, um, one of the most serious ice routes in the Alps. And sitting on the summit of Lake Court, we looked right across, right there, is the Walker Spur. We were going to go and do the Walker Spur next. It was the route that I had w always wanted to climb in the Alps. Just the most fabulous pillar, this beautiful line on a mountain. And Lloyd and I said, we'll do the Walker Spur next, and then we'll drive over to um, Grindelwald, and we'll do the Eiger. I, was, I had waited for four seasons, for the right time, the right person. I didn't, I never wanted to die in the mountains. And it's so easy to die climbing. It really is. And I always played it cautious. But here I was with my best partner. I was going really well. And we were going to do it. And we went down to the valley and it started to rain. And for the next two weeks, it just poured rain and up high, it was snowing and blowing. And that sort of ended the season, so I never got those two great climbs. And it's the only climbing regret that I have, that I didn't, didn't get the walker spur. I really would have liked that one. But um, I got lots else. You don't get everything in life, and I'm happy. I, I didn't get everything, but nobody does. Yeah. Not too long after that, independently, Lloyd and Dougal both lost their lives. That must have been devastating for you. They did. Um, Lloyd died in 1976 from cancer. Very sad. Some of the folks in the audience will have helped bury Lloyd out at the Mount View Cemetery. Saddest day of my life. Uh, he died of cancer, had three young daughters. Dougal died the next year in an avalanche. Um, and I lost my two big brothers and felt very alone. Uh, at Lloyd's funeral, they had a piper. Lloyd was from Nova Scotia, of course, of Scottish background. They had a piper, and they read a poem, which I'm going to read now, in memory of Lloyd and Dougal. And it's the most beautiful poem. It's called Coronach for a Mountaineer. It was written by Hilton Brown. The mist drops low on crag and corry. The evening settles on scour and ben. Homes the late eagle from his foray. The light goes out of the silent glen. The night closes, the shadows soften on granite mountain and heather hill. And the climbing feet that came so often are still, are still. And they will not come again. The eye that measured the climb before it, the feet that followed the eye that led, the strength that shouldered the pack and bore it, the gallant body, the steadfast head, and the great heart that drove them higher till the peak was scaled and the summit won. Ever a fighter, ever a trier, all are done, and the climber of hills is dead. Lover of mountains, the twilight lingers on alpine snows and highland screes. Eve, with her soft, caressing fingers, smooths out furrow and fold and crease, that dawn may light them again tomorrow, as endless eons of dawns must do. But the night that falls is a night of sorrow. Not you, not you, shall see that dawn on these. 
The night falls on Crag and Cory. Now where the suns of noonday shone, homes the last eagle from his foray. But there must be mountains where you have gone. Hills, great hills, to be friend and foe. Hills to comfort you, hills to cheer. Wherever lovers of mountains go, there as here, climb on, old friend, climb on. Wasn't that beautiful? That, who, who was there that day in the Mount View Cemetery to bury Lloyd? John was. Yeah. Saddest day of my life. Just oh, the tears flowed. Anyways. 73 was a difficult year, the end of 73. You went to Delgary in the fall, and that was also a tragic and difficult expedition. It was. It was very difficult. Um, yeah, uh, in 1973, after Lloyd went back to Canada, I turned my attention to the Himalayas. I had been invited to join a British expedition to an unclimbed 25,000-foot mountain in Nepal called Dalagiri 4. Well, it was a disaster. It was a cock-up. We didn't have enough money to pay our bills. The guys who were organizing the trip hardly knew where they were going, didn't know what they were getting into. It was a really hard climb. Um, two guys died on the expedition. It was devastating. It, uh, and you just work so hard. I mean, at one point, we went 25 days without a rest day, fixing rope and climbing and carrying loads every day, 25 days up early in the morning. It was so hard. And then Alan Dewison died in a fall, and one of our Sherpas died, and, and uh, I came home just shattered from that. And you wrote about that? I did. This is the first time I wrote something. Mm. And I wrote in the Canadian Alpine Journal of that experience. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'll read the first, chap uh, first paragraph, and then I'll read the last paragraph. On the 19th of November, 1973, Alan Dewison, 27 years old, was killed in a fall of 1,500 feet from a call on the southwest ridge of Dalagiri 4. Four days later, Raju Pradhan, Little Kansa, was buried in an avalanche several thousand feet above base camp. After 40 days and nights of privation, exhausting work, and constant danger, it was virtually impossible to feel anything. All emotions drained. I simply felt ill and a little more numb. The black cloud hanging over the expedition from the beginning had burst and taken two of our finest and most innocent, quiet, inoffensive Alan and laughing little Kansa. The question whether it was worth it, the loss and the sacrifice, no longer had any meaning. Everything had lost meaning. And then the last, the last paragraph in the article. Back in London, I sit in a house where I spent 10 days this spring. I am cut, cut off, isolated, a different person. I have changed too much to be able to reconstruct my past life, what I was and did and felt. I sit and do nothing and feel nothing. The Himalayan cold permeates more than the body. I suppose I will laugh and feel joy again, but I have learned the truth of the statement. In the Himalayas, there are no conquerors, only survivors. So that was my first article. Happy, happy talk. <laughs> Let's move things forward a bit to Mount Logan. Went to Mount Logan in 75? Um, no, 77. 77. 77. I, yeah, it was a, a big disappointment. It was a difficult trip. Um, I, I had uh, become enamored of Mount Logan, and we were looking to Canadian expeditions to the Himalaya, but we thought we'd get ready by going up to Mount Logan. So I put together an expedition in 1977 to the big southwest face, 14,000 feet high at its highest point. So almost three times 
as high as Cascade Mountain is above Banff. Big mountain. Didn't work out. Nobody got killed. But my team felt that it was too dangerous and too difficult and didn't want to continue. And I came home just so disappointed and so shattered. But turned around. I met John Jones, uh, a friend from the Calgary Mountain Club. And I was telling him about this fabulous route that I had seen on Mount Logan, the East Ridge, as we flew into the South Face. Well, Hans Moser had climbed it in 1959, and it's the most beautiful line. So in 1978, with John Jones, Trevor Jones, and Don Chandler, we went up there and we climbed it. And it was one of the best trips of my life. It was really hard. We had to wait 12 days to fly into the mountain. The plane was grounded for 12 days, and we just festered and waited for the weather to clear up. Then we got in there. The weather was good. We were going to climb the ridge. It's 12,000 vertical feet, and <coughs> it goes up to 20,000 feet. So we were going to climb it alpine style, but we were going to acclimatize as we went up. And we got as far as 16,000 feet after about a week, and then it stormed. And it was just a ferocious storm. The wind blew 100 kilometers an hour for a week, and we were pinned down in our tent. And we waited, and we waited, and we waited, and we ate very little. And then eventually it cleared up. And on the 15th day, we got to the summit. This is going alpine style, out of one pack. No ferrying loads, just going alpine style. On day 15, we got to the summit. Magical day, 30 below, crystal clear, a bit of a wind, and, uh, um, and you could see forever. And then two days later, we were back down again. So it was one of the best experiences of my life. And I have to thank my companions, John Jones, Trevor Jones, and Don Chandler, they were great. They knew I had had such a bad experience in the Himalayas and then such a disappointing experience the year before. They wanted me to get to the top. And we did. And it was happy. And we came home. Happy. Had a happy expedition. Not long after you took a break from climbing, right up until the mid to late 80s, but during that time in Calgary, yeah. it was quite a productive time for you. You became the president of the Calgary Mountain Club. I did, I did. Um, yeah, well, just to give a bit of background, I got sick. I had a couple of very serious psychotic breaks, um, nervous breakdowns, you could call them. I ended up in the psychiatric ward at the Foothills Hospital for several months in 75 and again in 79. Um, after I came out in 79, I was just so burned out and so exhausted. Um, I couldn't think about climbing. And I actually settled down for about eight years. I lived very happily with uh, a woman, Vivian Carson, in suburbia, in Calgary. Um, it was a comfortable life. I healed at a good time. I think Vivian and I were good to each other. But eventually, we went our separate ways. During that time, I was very involved in the Calgary Mountain Club. I became president of the club. Um, it was a big time for the Calgary Mountain Club. Kevin Doyle, Barry Blanchard, Jeff Marshall, Steve DeMaio, Brian Gross, all these guys, Dave Cheeseman, the greatest climbers ever to come out of this part of the world, were on a roll. And I was organizing the parties for all of them. Uh, I, was, I, I was the president of the club. And it was a good time, the 80s. And uh, yeah, so I spent seven years in suburbia, but eventually uh, the call of the mountains was too great, and, and I went back to the mountains. You put together your first book during that? I period. did, I did. I wrote a book, um, The History of the Calgary Mountain Club was my first writing project, and self-published, uh, but uh, yeah, it's my first book. I've still got copies available. <laughs> yeah. During the late 80s and into the 90s, uh, you seemed to be having a, a pretty fabulous time. You were on a bit of a roll. You had guided the Rogers Pass to the Bugaboos, 
Southern Rockies Traverse twice. Twice, yeah. Um, there was a Mount Logan ascent, and, yeah. and all of the camps that you used to run for the Alpine Club. Yeah. Were yeah. you reading books still in those days, mountaineering books? I was. I've I've continued to read adventure books. All the great polar explorers, the desert explorers, the sailors. Fabulous books. Explorers are such good writers, many of them. And I've got one quote I'm going to read here. Time to read the quote? Sure. Yeah, yeah from... Uh, it's a guy by the name of Wilfred Thesiger, an Englishman. Um, and he wrote this book called Arabian Sands. Well, Thesiger was actually born in Abyssinia in the late part of the 19th century. His father was a diplomat, and he grew up in Ethiopia, had this fabulous, adventurous life. But anyways, later in his career, he went with the Bedouin and crossed the empty quarter of Saudi Arabia, 800 miles without water. And he wrote a beautiful book about that called Arabian Sands. And he, he had this quote. Actually, the, it's a great book. Actually, if anybody wants my reading list, I have a great reading list. Just email me. I'm easy to find. Just Google Chick Scott. My website comes up, and my email's on it. Just email me, and I'll send you a reading list. So this is what Thesiger says. For years, the empty quarter had represented to me the final unattainable challenge which the desert offered. Suddenly, it had come within my reach. I remembered my excitement when Lean had casually offered me the chance to go there, the immediate determination to cross it, and then the doubts and fears, the frustrations and the moments of despair. Now I had crossed it. To others, my journey would have little importance. It would produce nothing except a rather inaccurate map, which no one was ever likely to use. It was a personal experience, and the reward had been a drink of clean, nearly tasteless water. I was content with that, isn't it? And, and it sums up the heart of adventure. You just do it to do it, not for the video that comes afterwards. <laughs> but maybe for the book that comes afterwards, because but, in the 1990s, you really did reinvent yourself as a writer. I did, I did, yeah. How did uh, that come about? Well, I had been guiding. I had a great time from 88 to 93, I guided almost full-time for five years without a license. Don't ask me how I did that, but <laughs> it's, it's very interesting. Anyways, I decided at the end of my career I would get a ski guide's license. So I took the ski guide's test, and they failed me. Um, they said I did not, what they said on my evaluation form was that I did not ski to an ACMG standard. So I was upset. And some of you remember. I mean, my whole life had been derailed. Everything was going that direction, the guiding direction. And all of a sudden, it's just like the train goes off the track and into the bush. Um, I didn't know what to do. I visited Hans Moser. He was very nice. He, he became a great supporter and a mentor later years. And he, he wanted me to take the exam again. And he said he would pay if I would take it again. But... I said, I can't go back and face those guys again. They were in grade school when I was skiing the Great Divide Traverse. <laughs> I can't face And they failed me. So, uh, so I didn't know what to do. And Han said, well, it's not what happens to us in life. It's how you deal with it. And he was right. He said, you can deal with it in a positive way or a negative way. And as I drove down the road from Harvey Heights, back into Canmore, I said, I know what I'll do. I'll write the guidebook. <laughs> so I did. So I became a writer. And the next winter, I wrote uh, Summits and Ice Fields, had a wonderful time researching and writing. I love doing it. It's what I'm really naturally good at. And uh, in 1994 at the Mountain Guides Ball, there was my beautiful guidebook on each table and I felt a little bit vindicated. 
It was nice. Now all the guides and all the guide aspirants use my book, of course, to figure out where they're going. <laughs> Anyways, and, and that started me on a writing career. And since then, I've had uh, 20 years, more than 25 years, of fabulous writing books. What book are you writing now? What are you working on? Um, well, I'm working on a book on Mount Assiniboine, uh, not just the lodge, although Mount Assiniboine Lodge has commissioned me, but about uh, the early explorers, the first mountain climbers, A.O. Wheeler, the Boundary Survey, the Lodge, Erling Strom, Lizzie Rummel, um, the park, of course, and modern day up to today. And it's a fabulous project, although it's becoming bigger. Uh, some of the, sometimes these books get really big. In 2016, you did really the unexpected and embarked on you know, what many folks call the, the really great adventure. You got married. I did. <laughs> How's married life true to you? Well, married life is wonderful. Kathy and I get along great. And um, I have to say that these are the best years of my life. Um, marriage was my idea. Kathy was completely shocked when I proposed to her. I proposed on an island, a Greek island, with a glass of wine in her hand. Um, but I loved Kathy, and I knew that she was a good woman, um, that I could trust her, and that she, I thought, trusted me. And uh, yeah, so we got married. Some of you came to the wedding. It was a fabulous wedding. Charlie and Louise Locke really pulled out all the stops, and we had 250 people up at uh, the Lake Louise Ski Resort, and, uh, and since then, Kathy and I, it's, been, it's wonderful to share your success with somebody. And now, after many years of, of struggle, yeah, I mean, I, I slept in the ditch a lot <laughs> over the years. And now, yeah, we get invited to Skokie Lodge, we get us invited to Assiniboine Lodge, George and Rosalie Schwartz, are very good to us. They invite us to the Post Hotel. I mean, life is good. And, <laughs> and, but it's so much better to have somebody to share it with. And, and uh, so, Kathy, I'm having the best time of my life, and I hope she is too. I spent a lovely evening in Ottawa last fall with you and Kathy. Uh, you, that evening, received the Sir Christopher Ondaatje Medal for Exploration from the Royal Canadian Geographical Society, national recognition for your contributions to mountain culture. What did that, what did that award mean to you? Well, it was very nice to get a national award, and, and from a body as prestigious as the Royal Canadian Geographic Society. So it, it really did mean a lot. Um, but you know, the nicest recognition I get is from you in people's faces. When I'm sitting out there on the bench or I'm walking down the street and people say hi to me and we stop and we talk, that's what really matters is, yeah, if you're famous and you get awards and you got a chest full of medals, that's one thing. But when people are your friends and, and stop and talk to you in the street and feel they can, that's even more important. Hmm. I want to bring this back to wrap things up a little bit with the most, your most recent writing project that you just completed for uh, John Hartman's project. Yeah. Tell us a bit about that project, um, if you could. Well, some of you may remember a couple of years ago, John Hartman, an artist from Ontario, um, painted the Great Divide Ski Traverse. I mean, can you believe it? He painted the Great Divide Ski Traverse, but he did. He flew over it and he painted it. And then he painted uh, portraits of uh, the four of us who were on the team and a number of other mountaineers. And there was a big opening and display here at the White for several months. Well, John has a new project. He loves these big, immense projects. So he's doing a book, he, he's doing a, a an exhibition uh, that's coming out in October 
with about 30 or 35 writers from across Canada, and he's painting portraits of them and the landscapes that are special to them. And he asked me to be one of them. Um, and this, the, his, his project is called Many Lives Mark This Place. John Hartman paints Canadian writers in the landscapes that inspire them. So he asked me to write 500 words for that, and, and I did. And it hasn't even been published yet, so you're getting a scoop. <laughs> yeah. So I'll read that? Please do, yeah. Yeah. When I discovered the Rocky Mountains as a teenager, it was as if a door opened from the box that I had been living in, and I stepped into a magic world of peaks and stars, the smell of wood smoke, and the sighing of the wind in the pines. It was springtime. The sap was rising in the trees, and the melting snow was dripping off the roof of our wilderness cabin. I fell in love with the mountains, and for almost 60 years now, my life has been devoted to the great ranges of the world. The first ice field that I ventured onto was the Wapt Ice Field, northwest of Lake Louise. My best friend, Jerry Walsh, and I skied from the ice fields parkway across Pato Lake, up a canyon, and onto the Pato, Pito Glacier. Later in the afternoon, we set up our tent, my first night camped on a glacier. It was a cold and alien world, but so pure and beautiful. This was 1964, and there were no huts and very few ski mountaineers in the area. It was our private alpine paradise, and for a few days, our sacred country. Since then, I have spent many hundreds of nights camped on the snow, on glaciers and ice fields. I have skied 10 grand traverses across the immense glacial wilderness of Western Canada. I have carefully threaded crevasses and negotiated steep avalanche slopes. In cloud and fog, I have made my way forward with compass in hand. At night, I have lain in my sleeping bag and listened to the snow blown by the wind brush against the tent walls. In morning light, shovel in hand, I have dug our little shelter from the drifts. Then, back in the tent, I have sat contentedly and made tea and listened to the stove purr. In other words, in a white and frozen world, I have found a home and made a beautiful peace with myself. The high alpine world is an intellectual place, one of philosophy and contemplation. Unlike the oceans and jungles, there is little life, little distraction. There are few sounds. The wind, of course, always the wind. The occasional crack from the ice or the rumble of a distant avalanche. Rarely a raven flies over and says hello with a raucous cry. As I grow older, it becomes harder for me to venture into this world. My bones ache sleeping on the thin pad, and the cold penetrates even the most modern down clothing. But I have my photographs, and I have my memories. I have been there. I have known the perfection of wind-blown snow. I have known the relentless roar of the blizzard, and I have known the infinite beauty of the starlit sky. Orion is an old friend. I will ski my last ice field sometime soon, but it will not be a sad moment. It will be a time to rejoice at the great blessing of a rich and adventurous life. Okay. Well, on that high note, um, <laughs> please join me in thanking Chick for a wonderful evening. Thanks so much, Chick. <laughs>